Resourceful Designer, episode 153, Seven Business Plan Mistakes Designers Make. Welcome to the Resourceful Designer Podcast, offering solutions to streamline your graphic and web design business so you can get back to designing. And now, your host. He'd love to present at a design conference. Mark DeCote. Welcome to the show. If this is your first time tuning in, I want to thank you for taking a little bit of time and deciding to test out Resourceful Designer and see if it's for you. I'm hoping you will stick around, and if you do like it, go back through my back episode. I have lots of great topics I've discussed over the past couple of years all about running a graphic design business. Everything from dealing with isolation to client acquisition to task management and so much more. So if you're new to the podcast, welcome, settle in, and I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Speaking of this week's episode, today I'm going to be sharing common mistakes that designers make when it comes to a business plan. I'm also going to share a tip of the week that could possibly help limit the number of revisions your clients ask for before ending the episode with a question from Rosie about balancing multiple priorities. Now, I've had a very busy week so far. I'm still working on a personal project that I mentioned in a previous podcast, although not as much as I would have liked. For some reason, I keep getting interrupted by those darn clients that want me to do stuff for them. Huh, they're so annoying, don't you think? Our life as a designer would be so much easier if we didn't have to deal with clients. If only. Now, I also took over a second website for an existing client of mine. I had designed their website, and they had another website that they had done themselves years ago. And they asked me if I can take over maintenance and hosting of that website in the hopes that sometime soon they're going to ask me to redesign it. So I went through there, and what a mess of it. It was a WordPress site, and what a mess with all the stuff they had and plugins that were not needed. So I kind of cleaned that up a little bit for them, did some minor updates and got that into my list of client websites to manage. And as I said, hopefully, time will come where they need that one redesigned, and while I already have my foot in the door. Besides that, I've been working on some other interesting things, did another business card for a client, working on a logo for somebody else, and I did a couple of podcast artworks this week and have another few on the go. So I'm getting really busy with that. So those are just a few of the jobs that I've been working on this week. I want to say I love hearing in the Resourceful Designer Facebook group all the work that you guys are doing. I love seeing those posts where people are asking for critiques or just opinions. It's always a lot of fun. Now, if you're not a member of the Facebook group, you can join by visiting resourcefuldesigner.com group, which will redirect you to the Facebook group page where you can click the join button. But please do answer my three questions. If you don't answer them, I simply decline your request to join doesn't matter how good a designer you are. If you are a listener, it doesn't matter. If you don't answer those questions, I will decline your invitation. But if you do answer them, you're free to join. So I and everybody else in the group would love to have you there. And now, time for this week's tip of the week. Not a resource this time, but a tip of the week. And this was something that earlier this week I got thinking about this. See, I received a very short email from my copywriter this week. And the email read this, it says, Hi, Mark, here's the copy you asked for. Let me know if there's any changes you would like me to make. Signed, Pam. And of course, there was a Word document attached with all the copy for the project I am working on. But it's that second line of the email that gave me pause and really made me start thinking. And that was the line that read, Let me know if there are any changes you would like me to make. So in a way, she was actually encouraging me to make changes to what she wrote. And after reading that, I can't help but think that subconsciously, when I opened up that Word document to see what she had written, that deep down in my head somewhere, there was the thought to look for things that I can possibly want to change because she actually encouraged me to do so. Now, I didn't find anything. The copy was perfect and I used it as is. But this got me thinking about All the conversations that I see in the Resourceful Designer Facebook group and other Facebook groups and basically anywhere the designers talk, there's always a conversation that goes on about the number of revisions that clients ask for and how much of a pain it is or people losing money because there's so many revisions. And of course, the usual solution I hear in all these 
discussions is to limit the number of revisions you offer or to charge and, and offer, say, three or four revisions and then charge for anything beyond that. Now, I must say that I have never in my entire career as a designer limited the number of revisions a client can ask for. I've also never had an issue. In my 30 years plus of designing for clients, I've never had a client ask for a ridiculous amount of revisions. Sure, they'd come back with two or three, but some of these people that are saying they have like eight or a dozen revisions, I have never, ever had that. Now, of course, I'm not saying that that's because I'm some amazing designer and that my work is so good that it doesn't need revisions. No, I'm not saying that at all. But there is one thing that I don't do, and that is I have never asked my clients if there's anything they would like changed on a piece that I'm presenting to them. I will ask them what they like about the piece, and I will ask them what they don't like about my design. But if a client wants something changed, they'll ask me to make a change without me having to prompt them. So what's the point of mentioning it, which could potentially encourage them to look for things to change, even if they don't realize it, just the fact of asking them if there's anything here you would like me to change, subconsciously, it's planting that bug saying, okay, well, I'm going to look to see if there's anything I want changed. So I've been thinking about that this week, and I thought I'd share it as a tip of the week here. I don't know if it's really helpful or not, but it's something that I thought of, and I decided to mention it. So if you ask your clients if there's anything they would like changed in the designs that you present to them, maybe you should try altering your wording and see if it potentially reduces the amount of revisions you're asked to do. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. It's just a thought. And now, seven business plan mistakes that designers make. Do you have a business plan? Did you create one when you started your design business? Are you thinking of starting a design business or in the process of writing a business plan? If you answered yes to any of those questions, believe it or not, you're in the minority. Most designers who either freelance or open their own design business don't bother creating a business plan unless it's something that they're actually asked to do. Like maybe the bank will will tell them they go to open up a business account for their bank and the bank will say, sure, we can open up a business account. We'd like to see your business plan. If for some reason you're going to get a loan for your business, maybe to set up some equipment and that you need to get a small loan, they will probably ask for a business plan. So most people only create a business plan whenever they are asked for it, when they need it. It's almost like, oh, it's a burden to create one. Now, I'm lucky when I opened up my business account 13, 14 years ago, my bank did ask me for one and I had to write one up. At the time, I admit, I thought it was a nuisance. But in hindsight, I'm really glad that they made me do it because that business plan gave me direction and it made me think about what I wanted to do, the steps I needed to take, what I needed to accomplish with my design business. So if you don't already have a business plan, and even if you've been in business for a year, two years, 10 years, 20 years, doesn't matter how long you've been doing this, if you don't have a business plan, you may want to take a little bit of time to think about it and write one up because it could make a world of difference in regards to the growth of your business. And whether you do have a business plan or you're going to write up a business plan, I'm going to share with you a few common business plan mistakes that you should avoid making. Now, mistake number one when it comes to writing a business plan is putting it off. As I said, most designers don't even bother with a business plan unless they're asked to create one. And that is a huge mistake. Once a business is up and running, most people think, oh, I don't need a plan. Or they feel that they're actually too busy running their business to actually make a plan for how to run their business. And believe it or not, the busier you are, the more you need a plan. Have you heard the term work on your business and not in your business? Well, a business plan will help you do just that by helping you focus on the things you need to do to work on your business. So the number one mistake is simply putting off creating the business plan. Now, mistake number two is fearing the plan. Thinking about writing up a business plan is much scarier than actually doing one. I remember when the bank asked me, I said, I didn't know what to do. I'd never done a business plan before. What a daunting task that was. 
But in reality, it wasn't that difficult. A business plan is not a thesis paper or a novella that you're trying to write. It's a simple guide for you to follow that will help your business succeed. Yes, when the bank asks for it, it's a guide for them to see that you actually have an idea that you're going forth with. You're not just starting a business on a whim. You actually have some structure behind it. But that same business plan can be used by you in order to maintain that structure and to give you focus. Now, there are plenty of great resources online. Simply do a Google search for creating a business plan, or you can check out your local municipality. If you have a small business development center or or some sort of municipal or government office devoted to small business, I'm sure they can help you out. You can also go to your libraries. You can check the banks. Often banks will actually have pamphlets or booklets that will explain how to write a business plan. And there's plenty of other resources that can help you write one. So there's no reason to fear writing a business plan. Now, when it comes to actually writing a business plan, another mistake that people make is ignoring cash flow. Most designers, when we think of working, we think in terms of profits and not of cash. Profits being your sales, the designs you do, the the work you do for the clients, minus your costs and your expenses. And that makes sense. Unfortunately, you don't spend profits on a day-to-day basis. You spend cash. And that's where a business plan can help you out. Because when you're running a home-based design business, there are plenty of things that require payment beyond the business itself. Things like utilities, things like property tax, things like home maintenance, things like savings, either for personal holidays or even for retirement. All these things are extra, and they're not really considered costs or expenses, but they do eat into those profits. So part of a good business plan involves creating a kind of a cash flow table for you to see exactly how much of your profits gets converted into actual spendable cash. Because once you say, okay, I'm going to charge a client $1,000 for this, and I had to give 200 to, I don't know, an illustrator to pay them for their illustration, and then I had to give another 300 to the copywriter to come up with some copy, and that leaves me with $500. I made $500 on this project. Well, no, there's a lot of things that eats into that $500. And without actually thinking those things through, you actually believe that you're making more money than you actually are. You are making those profits, but it's the cash flow that is not as much as you think because that extra $500 has to be distributed in a bunch of different ways. So creating a cash flow table in your business plan can help you see where the money is allocated So that you know exactly how much money you actually have that's disposable, spendable after a project is completed. And that can really help you set goals for down the line. Now, speaking of goals, mistake number four is creating vague goals. A business plan is not about the dreams you have. You don't write a business plan saying, I want to be the best designer in my area. That stuff is all hype. There's no way for you to progress and actually measure that you're the best designer in your area. The objective of a business plan is to generate results. And for results, you need to be able to track and follow up on things. I talked about SMART goals on the podcast back in episodes 55. And just recently, I talked about goals in episode 150. And SMART goals, if you you remember what they are, are a great way to look at a business plan. In it, you should write specific dates, when you'd like to accomplish things or uh, timeframes. You need to write down the responsibilities, the things you need to do in order to achieve those. You need to identify the tasks that are involved. You also should put down what sort of budget, if there's some monetary, like if one of your things is to maybe get into video animation and your computer's not powerful enough, well, part of your business plan may be to somehow set aside a budget to get a more powerful computer. So setting up some sort of budget that you allot to those responsibilities of achieving the goal is all part of a business plan. You also use it to set milestones where you can follow up and you can check on your progress against your business plan. Because no matter how well written out your business plan is, it's meaningless if it doesn't produce results. And the only way you're going to know that it produced results is if you have measurable factors in there that you can follow up and check up on your progress as time goes by. 
and see where you stand. So you need to create smart goals or solid direction to go. No creating vague goals. Now, mistake number five that designers often make when they do make a business plan is copying somebody else's plan. You can go online, do a Google search and say business plan for a design business, and you will come up with some completed plans, but that's not your business. And sometimes it might be okay if you're just presenting it to the bank, hoping to get some money from them or get an account started up or whatever, but it won't actually help you and your business grow. There's no one size fits all when it comes to a business plan. Now, the resources that I mentioned earlier, such as business development centers, the libraries, the banks, they can all help direct you. But the plan itself needs to be tailored to your specific business and to your specific needs. Remember that a business plan can be a sales plan. It can be a detailed action plan. It should be a financial plan. It should be a marketing plan for how to grow your business, and it can even be a professional growth plan for how you are going to grow as a designer. Now, a business plan is great for starting a new business. It's, I would say it's almost essential for starting a new business, but it's also used to run and grow an existing business. You can bet that big design agencies such as Pentagram or Landor, they not only have a business plan. But I'm sure they regularly review and revise it as their business grows. And there's no reason for you not to do the same, even though you're nowhere near as big as those agencies. A business plan is an extremely valuable asset to any business. Mistake number six that designers often make when it comes to a business plan is diluted priorities. A business plan is meant to be focused. It's a focused strategy for your design business. Therefore, you need to focus on the priorities in your plan. A plan with 20 plus items to keep track of is not very focused and will be much harder to adhere to. You need to rein in everything. It's great to say, I want to be a designer that does absolutely everything and create a plan on how you're going to get to do everything, but you'll achieve a lot more success if you narrow it down to a few things. And I said a business plan can be altered over time. Create a business plan focusing on a few little things, and once you accomplish those, then you can alter your plan to go over something else. Each section of your business plan should only have maybe three or four key items that you're working towards. Remember, the more items that you're focusing on, the less importance and the less attention you can devote to each one. It makes sense. It's a lot easier to accomplish three or four goals than it is to divide your time amongst accomplishing 20 plus goals. So a short, precise business plan has a much greater chance of success than a long diluted one. And that falls into number two that I shared a while ago, fearing the plan. A lot of people think that a business plan is this huge, huge thing. It doesn't have to be. A business plan could be just a couple of pages long. And if it's done right, those couple of pages are all you need in order to set a destination and a focus for your business. Now, the final mistake that I want to share with you that designers often make when it comes to a business plan is simply not reviewing the plan. I'm hoping that I've convinced you of the importance of having a business plan. Even if your business is already established, it's a good practice to write up a plan of where do you want to be two years from now, five years from now? Do you even know? Or are you just working on a day-to-day? Let's get the next paycheck in. Let's get the next client on board. That's great for now, but it doesn't help you in the long run. You need to set some goals and know that five years from now, this is where I want to be. Because if you don't have those sort of things, you won't know five years from now if you are considered a success or not. Maybe you'll be doing the exact same thing you were. And if after five years, you're still working the exact same way and nothing has improved or progressed, To some people, that would mean your business isn't a success because a successful business improves over time. So mistake number seven, again, is not reviewing your plan. And that's because having a business plan isn't very helpful if you only use it to start your business. You need to review it on a regular basis and you need to make amendments to it as needed. Set reminders. I have a calendar reminder once a year on my calendar. I get a reminder to go over my business plan and make sure that everything is still on board. 
I have in my business plan what I want to be doing from a year from now. I want have what I want to be doing five years from now and 10 years from now. Now, the five years from now is something that doesn't change very often and the 10 years very seldom. But what I want to be doing a year from now, that part of the business plan, I change that on a regular basis as I see how things go. Did I achieve what I set out last year to do by this year? If not, why didn't I? It helped me reflect. What did I do wrong or what did I do that prevented me from achieving that? Maybe at some point I decided to divert to something different and I decided to change ideas. Well, that's okay. Now I readjust my business plan and I want to review it a year from now to see where things are. Again, it all comes down to these SMART goals, but it's more than just setting a goal. It's an actual plan for your business. So once you have a plan, set a reminder to review it on at least an annual basis. And if need be, make amendments to it once per year to see how it is going forth. And doing so will help you stay focused and it'll show you the direction that you need to take to achieve success for your business going forward. As I mentioned earlier, there's no way to know if your business is successful unless there's something to measure it upon. And simply looking at how much you brought in in revenue this year compared to last year, to some people, that may be good enough. But that could be just luck or there's so many other factors playing into it. You need to be able to measure a bunch of different key points in your business strategy that are written out in your business plan to know if your business is actually as successful as you think it is. So those are the seven mistakes that designers often make when it comes to a business plan. Mistake number one was simply putting it off, not writing a plan. Number two was fearing the plan, being overwhelmed by the thought of a plan. Number three was the financial part of it, ignoring cash flow, not realizing that the profit that you are making is not all money in your pocket. Some of that profit will be used for other stuff. And you have to know that because if you don't, you could run into cash flow problems. Number four was creating vague goals. You need to have firm ideas in place for what you want to achieve. It's the only way to measure them. Number five was simply copying somebody else's plan and using it for your own. There may be some parts of it that you can incorporate into your plan, but it should really be written specifically for you and your business in mind. Number six was diluted priorities. A business plan needs to be focused. It doesn't need to be 20, 30, 40 pages. You can have a business plan that's two or three pages long, and that's it. As long as the priorities in it are focused and stuff you can actually adhere to. So no diluted properties. And finally, number seven was not reviewing your plan. A plan is not simply to get your bank to lend you money or to open up a bank account or or whatever. It's there to help you grow, and you need to keep referring to it. So hopefully I've shared the importance and convince you, if you don't already have a business plan, to take some time to think something up. Write down some stuff. As I said, it doesn't have to be very long, just a couple of pages. How do you want to market yourself going forward? How do you want to go about acquiring clients? What do you want your business to look like one year from now, two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? Set some goals, set some milestones, stuff that you can actually focus on and then review it on a regular basis. And by doing this, you have a much, and I emphasize, much better chance of having a successful business. People that simply start a business and get to work day after day after day fall into that trap that I mentioned earlier of working in their business and not on their business. And working in your business, there is no end and no relief no growth. There's nothing in sight. You need to be working on your business if you want it to succeed, if you want to be happy, if you want to be successful. And a great way to do that is by having a business plan. Now, I would love to know, do you have a business plan for your design business? And when did you write it? Did you write it up beforehand or did you write it up after you had started your business? And do you adhere to it? Please let me know by leaving a comment for this episode visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 153 and let me know. And now this week's question of the week. This week's question comes in from Rosie. Rosie wrote, how do you balance multiple priorities? It causes me a great deal of anxiety to leave things unfinished. In a perfect world for me, 
I would only have one thing to do at a time and could just work from beginning to end, but that never happens. If you're working on four things at the same time and none of them are finished, that's me right now, how do you know when is the right time to stop working on one thing and pick up working on another? Well, thank you very much for the question, Rosie. This is a little bit hard to answer because everybody is a little bit different. Some people like yourself feel that anxiety whenever you have multiple things on the go like that, and other people excel in that situation. I'm a little bit of the latter. I love having a whole bunch of things on the go. I wouldn't want to be working on one thing and one thing only. I love having multiple projects going. But the way that I manage them is through, first of all, time management. I block times out. So when I start my day, I know that from such and such a time till such and such a time, I'll be working on this project. Then it doesn't matter how far I've gotten. Say by 10 o'clock, if I start at nine, say, and I'll say I'll put an hour in to do this, by 10 o'clock, I'm moving on to the next thing, no matter where I was in the other one. And then I might work from 10 till 12. I'll put two hours into this other project and I'll, I'll work on that. Then at 12, I'll take a break for lunch. I'll be gone for whatever, a half an hour, an hour, whatever I decide to take for lunch. And when I come back, say at one o'clock, I know, according to my schedule that I did for the day, at one o'clock, I will be working on another project, or I might be working on one of the previous ones that I worked in the morning. Maybe I'll continue the one I was working on before lunch, but I will bracket these things off. And a little bit of progress in each one will help things get done. Now, a lot of this is determined by deadlines. If I have a, a project that's due in two days and I have another project that's due in two weeks, Obviously, I'm going to devote more time to the one that's due in two days. But again, time blocking is a great way to do that. You actually set up, and I don't go so far as setting a timer. When I say I'll stop at 10 o'clock, sometimes it's like 10.10, or sometimes it's 9.50 where I look up and I'll just go, okay, well, now's a good time to stop, or oops, I went over, so be it. Now I'll move on to the next thing. But I try to do that. I try to space things out so that, first of all, I don't want to get stagnant. If I work on the same project for a long period of time, after a while, I start losing interest. I want to change up my mindset, which helps me boost my creativity by changing things I'm thinking on. I did cover some of the stuff that you're asking about in a few different episodes. I look back in episode 66 of the podcast, which was tackle your to-do list with tasks and projects. That one there helps you to differentiate how to get things done. You don't just say, okay, I need to work on a poster for a client. You divide it down into smaller pieces. I need to find the fonts for the project. I need to find out what color palette I'm going to do use. I need to find the imagery that I'm going to use. And all these individual tasks will help you get through all these things because as you cross things off, you feel good about yourself. It actually releases some endorphins. And as you cross these things off your list, you are seeing visible progress towards completing the project. So listen to episode 66, then episode 104, which titled Why Your To-Do List May Be Failing, might shed some insight into that. And then just a couple of episodes ago, setting micro goals for your design business. Some of the information I shared in that episode, 150, also goes a lot into how to balance these multiple priorities that you're asking about. Now, don't forget that if it is feeling too much for you, it is okay to say no. I don't do it as much now, but back when I used to hand code my websites before I got into WordPress and I would hand code websites, I never worked on more than two websites at a time. I always waited to have one website launched and and finished before starting on another one. And I would tell my clients as much. If they came to me with a website project, I would tell them that I only work on two at a time because I found that more than that would be overwhelming And when you're working in code all the time, working on one website and another, I I just didn't want to get mixed up. Not that I ever thought I would, but to me, it was just simpler to say, I'll work on two different websites. That way I can have one in one stage and another in another. And then when one of them is complete, then I can take on another project. And my clients were okay with that. So it was putting stuff off. And at some points, if you're too busy and a client comes on and asks you to do something, it's okay to say, no, I can't handle that. My workload is too high right now. And it's up to the client whether they want to wait until your workload dies down or possibly find another designer. And that's just a risk you have to take. But if you do feel that that anxiety, if it is something that is actually affecting you when you have all these different things, 
you could meet with some groups and talk to people, maybe partner up with somebody that can help take some of the workload off. There are a lot of designers that I know that do have somebody that they can offload some work. So if they start to feel a little bit overwhelmed, they can get some of the smaller projects done by other people. And that has helped them and has also helped them grow their business because now they're kind of like a micro agency as opposed to just a solo designer. As for the last part of your question, Rosie, where you say, how do you know when's the right time to stop working on one thing and pick up working on another? That's really hard to decide. And that's why I use the time blocks. To me, it's just, if I say I'm going to work on something for two hours, I work on it for two hours. After two hours, I'll stop wherever I am. Again, it depends if I'm right in the middle of something, I might add in a little bit of extra time to finish that exact thing that I was doing. But once I'm done, then I'll move on to something else and pick that one up again later. But that works for me. Uh, Unfortunately, I don't know if that'll work for you, Rosie. Everybody has their own little methods of working. So that's the, the best advice that I can give is based on my experience. Now, if anybody listening has an answer to Rosie's question, you can leave a, a comment for this episode at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 153. Leave a comment for Rosie and tell her how you would handle multiple unfinished jobs and how you know when to stop working on one and picking up the other and how you deal with the anxiety of all these unfinished tasks to complete. If you have some help for Rosie, leave a comment for the episode. So thank you very much for your question. Now, if you have a question that you would like me to answer in a future episode of the podcast, please visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash feedback and submit your question there. Now, I would love your help in spreading the word about the podcast. If you know or know of a designer that you think could benefit from Resourceful Designer, please let them know about the show. Tell them it's available everywhere the podcast can be found, including on Spotify. And if they're not sure how to subscribe to a podcast, chances are they know how to download an app. So tell them that Resourceful Designer is also available as an app for both Apple and Android. And once they download it, all the episodes are available within the app. So thank you everyone who has recently tuned in. If this is your first episode or if you're still a new listener to Resourceful Designer, I really do appreciate you. And if you're a long-time listener, well, I appreciate you as well. So that's it for this episode. I am Mark Decote, wishing you all the best for your graphic design business. And as always, reminding you to stay creative. Thanks for listening to the Resourceful Designer Podcast at resourcefuldesigner.com.